you know the whole book of job if you see is on this man's agony physical and mental state in chapter 10 we read job job states i loathe my very life therefore i will give free rein to my complaint and speak out in the bitterness of my soul finally in chapter 30 he says terrors overwhelm me my life ebbs away days of suffering grip me night pierces my bones my gnawing pains never rest and then you have lamentations one entire book of lamentations is, is about the grief and sorrow of one man over evil and suffering in the world uh, uh, you know uh, jeremiah even says god deceived him and goes on to curse the day he was born uh, you know about elijah who battled the prophets and finally was discouraged and he was running away and uh, should we forget jonah uh you know uh, it's funny uh, there is this uh, this this passage that you read uh, god is asking is it right for you to be angry at that plant and jonah is like i just wished i was dead you know uh, i i just i just picture how that conversation would have gone it, it's it's so funny and and think about david you know whenever i feel lazy and i don't want to read the bible i just i just try to read one psalm and i'm really stunned every time you read psalm Uh, you are able to relate at the emotions of david many of which he exposes you know you can relate with every psalm one way or the other i don't think there is any other book you can in the scripture that in the bible that you can do that now here are some verses where he says i am troubled i am bowed down greatly i go mourning all the day long i groan because of the turmoil of my heart why are you cast down o my soul and why are you disquieted within me my heart pounds my strength fails me even the light has gone from my eyes i don't think we all have such grief especially knowing that you know uh, you know these guys are fully committed to god's work unlike us at least uh, we to a certain extent experience it i i believe much of the discouragement that we experience in our lives is designed to correct the defective views of god and his truth to help us reevaluate our lives and to check if there are areas that need to be disciplined and to those really really special ones i believe god brings grief and pain to prepare you for something bigger bible says moses left his rich life to become a shepherd for 40 years 40 years where god prepared can you believe what he would have done in 40 years i mean imagine you all you know probably if you go to uh, bible college three years you come out and then you do ministry it's amazing i mean it's like a factory but here is moses for 40 years he is trained in the desert in the hot sun probably taming sheep god trained him for those 40 years he lived a he lived an amazing life before that but god had to use that 40 years to train him for something bigger uh i want to come to today's passage today's uh passage that i had in mind it is uh the story of lazarus you all are very 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 familiar with the story of lazarus this is not uh new to you all this is a well known passage now i'm going to read uh, verse by verse uh john chapter 11 verse 1 to 7 now a man named lazarus was sick he was from bethany the village of mary and her sister martha this mary whose brother lazarus now lay sick was the same one who poured perfume on the lord and wiped his feet with her hair So the sister sent word to Jesus Lord the one you love is sick When he heard this Jesus said The sickness will not end in death No it is for the glory of God it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus So when he heard that Lazarus was sick he stayed where he was two more days and then he said to his disciples let us go back to Judea Now this is a very well known passage you all you know you don't need to really read or you know this by heart one of the great one of the seven great signs recorded by john in the scripture is this to establish a belief in christ the first one the you all know what it is the first sign is the wedding of cana where jesus turned water into wine it's amazing if you see the pattern it starts at a wedding and it ends where at a funeral okay it begins at a wedding and it ends at a funeral and uh, it's a picture of how jesus christ is wedded to the church and finally his love was ultimate love was shown to the church by his death on the cross it's just a it's just a pattern that you can see there but today's passage as you read you know you can see it is packed with emotions 
you know you can read fear you can read pain you can read worry you can see confusion sorrow tears it is fully packed with emotions uh, will a man of god experience trials griefs pain and suffering you know they often say right uh, um, uh, you will not experience grief if you are soaked in god's love and your faith is not you know if your faith is strong that is not possible if you are experiencing there's something wrong with you you know job's comforters had such a such a flawed view but here in the story if you read the facts do not lead to that conclusion think about it jesus dined at the home of mary and martha he preached at their home you know he didn't have many homes right jesus did not you know go to multiple homes he had few homes that he would fellowship often and this was one home where he often came he met he fellowship he taught and uh, uh, he loved mary martha and lazarus and we know that they as well loved him back in the letter it says the one you love is sick that itself shows how much you know they both loved each other so as soon as uh, they sent this uh, text they thought probably jesus was going to drop everything and hurry fast you know um, jesus is just going to run because we probably have fellowship with him he loves us but that is not what you see uh, that is not what happens jesus does not hurry fast jesus rather delays and you know often i i have understood that the lord often loves to break our assumptions our self seeking ideas and sometimes confidence based on pride because they often contradict to god's that is why isaiah writes my ways are not your your ways neither are my thoughts your thoughts if you love someone and you know he is sick what do you do naturally as in you rush to his aid imagine i'm about to die and i'm calling puneet and i'm saying brother i'm about to die and puneet is like i'm at a board meeting you know i'll set a timer on my xiaomi watch and you know uh, i'll 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 come and meet you once it's uh, once i get an alert uh, i know that he's not done it i mean when i was having covid uh, the reality was different he was the first person here by the way just just for the record i think but <laughs> so here is jesus you know he knows that the one his who he loves is sick and instead of hurrying and showing how much he loves he says i am not coming and goes on to do his business this is absolutely hard to imagine how i would receive jesus when he comes to my home the sisters here at least they went out to greet jesus i would say jesus i am not even giving you water you came to my home i i made chai for you i had you know fellowship with you i listened to you and when there was a need you are not even turning up you you not even make making it look important you you are delaying rather uh, you know if really jesus loved lazarus what he should have done probably should have taken the fastest metro he should have gone there you know or there is a better idea why does he even have to travel you know the story of capernaum right what did he do there in the story of capernaum he didn't even have to travel he just said the word and uh, you know he said just go it she be healed and uh, it was done jesus didn't even have to travel to the official house he had to simply say the word and the two miles away but it is a real shock here that despite loving this family so much jesus thinks right now i will delay how do you respond when jesus ignores you or when jesus is not punctual or when jesus is silent how do you respond to it you know in the previous chapter if you read you know what john writes jesus says i am the good shepherd in john 10 okay if you read john 10 he says jesus says, i am the good shepherd my sheep listens to my voice and look at john 11 where is the shepherd his sheep needs him and there is no you know his presence is not there i certainly think that this passage is not about lazarus but the sisters and to teach us on why god delays and removing some of the defective views you can have about god's love you know interestingly everyone in the story loved jesus mary and martha loved jesus lazarus loved jesus and disciples are there disciples though they were living with jesus and yet all of them were grieving mary and martha were grieving Lazarus was already dead and think about the disciples you know they tell lord uh, you know jesus is saying uh, in the next passage if you say uh, in verse 7 if you if you read he says let us go back to judea and the disciples are like are you crazy they're going to stone you we are on the hit list what are you thinking of you know and here is every single character in the story who loves jesus and yet what you see is that there is grief or some sort of some sort of uh, uh, you know some contradiction to what is expected as we reflect on this passage i think what is important is that we realize god does not number one that god does not operate on our timetable secondly that his love is not defined by your comfort and safety god's love is not defined by how comfortable you are how safe you are or you know how 
how healthy you are and i certainly think lastly that these god designed griefs and delays in our life the god designed griefs and delays in our life is the proof of our sonship the god designed griefs the pain that you experience is the proof of our sonship that is why we read in hebrews chapter 12 verse 5 to 6 it says my child don't think the lord's discipline is worth nothing and don't stop stop trying when he corrects you the lord disciplines those he loves he punishes everyone he accepts as his child so clearly it's a proof of our sonship again we read in romans 8 17 where paul says uh, if we are children then we are heirs heirs of god and co-heirs with christ if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory so what is the evidence of our sonship the evidence of that that we share in christ's glory it is that we share in his sufferings and then there is another word that we read in second corinthians chapter 4 verse 8 where paul writes we are hard pressed on every side but not crushed perplexed but not in despair we are hard pressed on every side but not crushed perplexed but not in despair we have to watch out if the hardship that we experience in our life while that is unavoidable careful if it leads to spiritual depression that is what paul says we are hard pressed on every side but not crushed we are perplexed but not in despair we have to watch out if these hardships and griefs that we experience in our life is leading in one way or the other to spiritual depression let's read the uh, the next verse from verse 9 to 14 jesus answered are there not 12 hours of daylight anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble for they see by this world's light it is when a person walks at night that they stumble for they have no light after he had said this he went on to tell them our friend lazarus has fallen asleep but i am going there to wake him up his disciple just replied lord if he sleeps he will get better jesus had been speaking of his death but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep so then he told them plainly lazarus is dead and for your sake i am glad i was not there so that you may believe let us go to him so as we read this story apparently jesus has got many plans on his mind you know one is that he wants to delay and second he is saying that you know i am glad for your sake i was not there who would say that if you say i am glad i was not there uh you know the one you love is dying but jesus says i'm glad what am i most interested what i am most interested is in your belief that i can teach you a thing or two that i can make your foundation stronger that is why throughout john that you read that after every major event you see that uh, uh, john says this he did so that the disciples believed this he did so they have faith after every major miracle you will see this you know somewhere you will see this text or a discourse jesus is giving on belief and faith on uh, uh, on when jairus' daughter was dying you know you can hear jesus uh, who overheard a conversation uh, that the messenger is bringing to jairus he says and after that jesus tells jairus don't be afraid just believe you know i believe the more deeper the ground is dug uh, during construction you see the structures they remain solid they remain strong they remain you know unbreakable and i believe often we experience events on our faith does not that does not look ordinary uh, 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 you know it it is the if these events are to 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 bring vigor in our life to growth in our life to shake us out of the comfort zone and to empower us often we experience such gri- griefs in our life what is jesus most interested in jesus is most interested in the foundation of our belief he saying i am glad that i am not there so that you will believe so that you will learn so that you will grow so it is not just signs and wonders but truly jesus is interested through these events what is the foundation of our belief are we grounded are we rooted are we growing uh, uh, 
if you read the uh, if you read the uh, parable of uh, Soa, if you read the uh, parable of uh, 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 the, the parable of uh, the sower, what you read here is that there were, you know, Jesus said there were many types of soil. Some fell along the path, some fell along the rocky places, some fell along the thorns, and then there was a good soil. And uh, 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 he says, the seed that fell on rocky ground was temporary, but it died when when sun came. Okay. And the seed that fell among thorns was choked by the worries of the world. And the only ground that bore fruit, the only ground that bore fruit was the ground that persevered. In that parable, if you see, out of all the four ones, the true ground that uh, bore fruit a hundredfold was the one that persevered. The ground that persevered is the one that uh, uh, that bore fruit. You read it here, you know, uh, I'm going to read from Mark chapter 4, verse 13 to 19. Jesus said, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? This farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed, uh, are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of his life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word choke the word, making it unfruitful. Jesus said, the ones that fell among the rocky places, what happens to that is that they hear the word, but instead of growing, they are broken. Instead of being built, they are, they are, you know, they are crushed. Jesus knows this and he explains that some people who hear the word receive it at first with gladness, but suffering makes them fall away. He said in verse 17, what did he say? Since they have no root, they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Jesus says, because they had no root, it only sustained for a short time. God is interested in establishing the root in our life. The strong roots that help us to sustain, the strong roots that can help us to fail, uh, face winds and trials, the strong roots that cannot be uprooted. And he uses events and incidents in our lives to establish us so that the seed will be more stronger, it will be more grounded, it will have a root. You know, in this parable, it's interesting what happened to the seed that fell along the path. It, the, Jesus said, the birds came and took it away. You know, it, it says in verse 15, some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown. Why does Satan come and take the word that is, you know, that is sown on that earth immediately? Because the devil does not want the word to go in, to penetrate your life, to make, to establish roots in your life. If that happens, he knows that there will be faith, you will be more rooted, you will be more grounded. So before that, the devil comes and snatches it away. That is why many of us listen to the message and, and often we, you know, uh, we listen to a lot of messages and we are sometimes confused. I know people who fight for trivial subjects. They, they go on YouTube, they look at multiple videos and they read multiple books and, you know, um, the, the, the growth is missing. But the, I, I think it is that the, the devil is just snatching the word that is just on the ground because it is not going deep. It is not being rooted. And this is the work of the devil. He does not want us to understand the word. He does not want the word to go deeper in our lives. And that is why he comes and snatches it away. Because if your faith is rooted and grounded, he knows that your faith is established and you can grow in Christ. And uh, um, sometimes that is why I see people fighting over trivial subjects. You know, it is not at all important. Why is the pen here? Why is the, you know, um, they look into the scripture and they look at some doctrine somewhere and they start fighting. You know, uh, this doctrine says this, this doctrine says that. It's actually trivial and they leave church and they fight about these trivial subjects. I think it is, it is just that the devil does not allow that seed to grow, the word of God to grow, and it is just on the surface. It comes and snatches it away so that it does not penetrate your heart. And because it is on the surface level, he comes up with all crazy ideas. You know, um, the Bible says that, Bible says this, this tradition, that tradition, and he confuses you. 
and that is that is why jesus wants the soil to you know the good soil that bore fruit persevered it persevered through all of it and that sort of soil will bear fruit jesus said in in john chapter 8 verse 31 i'm reading uh, john chapter 8 verse 31 where jesus said if you continue in my word you are truly my disciples discipleship often happens in the most difficult circumstances of our life you know someone once asked why is salvation a free gift but discipleship costly it's a it's a question that i actually thought it's true salvation is a free gift of god but why is discipleship costly and uh, that is why the soil that perseveres it requires discipleship and often this is why many often we see that as we progress in our christian life we have these events that bog us down that pull us down that make us backslide that does not want us to progress and does not want that seed to you know be rooted and, and, and to be established uh, paul wrote in second corinthians chapter uh, 4 verse 3 to 4 he wrote like this even if our gospel is veiled it is veiled to those who are perishing in their case the god of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of christ who is the image of god when the glory of god is described what does satan do he blinds the eyes of people so that they will not embrace it they will not see it it is only on the surface level you are not going beyond the surface level that is why often uh, the devil himself does not want us to see the light of the gospel let us uh, go to the uh, passage all right there's another thing that uh, we read uh, jesus said to the disciples in verse 9 jesus answered are there not 12 hours of daylight anyone are there not 12 hours it's moving fast you know what's happening yeah are there not 12 hours of daylight anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble for they see by this world's light it is when a person walks at night that they stumble for they have no light here's another principle that jesus is giving to his disciples when disciples said lord do you really want to go there you know scary we, sh- we are we're there people are going to stone us so jesus answers to his disciples in this manner are there not 12 hours of daylight anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble for they see by this world's light it is when a person walks at night that they stumble for they have no light in other words to a person who walks in the light of god in his truth and particularly to those who walk within his will there need not be fear because of god's sovereignty another principle being that god has a specific time and plan in our life that cannot be extended by anyone you can't do anything to it you are absolutely safe until your work is done within the given time nothing can destroy god's purpose if you are following the time he has designed for you that is why jesus always lived not by the emotions of people or by what is going to happen to him immediately he lived according to knowing the hour knowing what the father wants of him that was what you know he knew that his life is in the hands of his father uh, he believed in the sovereignty of the father and he believed that till the hour that god has you know set me here nothing is going to happen till the time the father set me here nothing is going to touch me he always lived being aware of the hour when are we in danger jesus said when you walk in the dark when we depart from the will of god when we depart from the scripture and when we are uh, uh, when we are uh, mixed up with a lot of you know uh, 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 things that distract us that we are often stumble and fall that is why in the end of jesus ministry you see there's an amazing thing that jesus said after three years of ministry jesus could say this i glorified you on earth i have finished the work you have given me to do jesus clearly lived being aware of the hour, being aware of the work that his father had given him. And nothing, no incident, no event could actually uh, sway him, distract him. Let's read uh, verses, John chapter 11, verses 17 to 31. In the story, as we continue to read on uh, 17, it says like this, On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. 
and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives, uh, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into this world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at, at the place where Martha had met her. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. I want to read verse 21 again. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You know, it's if you read this verse, it's more like, you know, I don't know, do you have to see, uh, it's in pity or in anger. You know, Martha saying, why didn't you come soon? Is it, how do you interpret this? How do you read this? Why didn't you come soon? Why are you now? You know, she was, why are you here now? She was a very bold person. You know that when Jesus was teaching at the home, uh, uh, the sisters were there and, you know, she was really uh, outright. She went to Jesus and said, what exactly is my sister doing? She's not, you know, helping in any ways and you don't care about it. She was a very forthright person and, uh, and a very outright person. And here, uh, when Jesus confronts her, she says, yes, my brother will rise and Martha, uh, Jesus says, your brother will rise and Martha answers, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. If any of us had to comfort Martha, how would we do it? You know, we would be there, how painful it is. We, I understand, Martha, what you're going through. You know, um, this is how probably we would, if we are there, we would comfort you. But what does Jesus do here? Uh, so like in the since the beginning we read, he's confronting our belief. Jesus confronts our belief. Do you believe this? For Jesus, what she believed was more important. Jesus challenges her and stretches her faith. Jesus goes, Jesus wants her to go beyond that knowledge of facts you know, theology, the doctrine that you have, but and know the person Jesus more. You know, our faith in Christ is more important when we deal with our grief. Bible is more than just events. Uh, it will it will remain an abstract idea if we do not consider a personal relationship with Jesus more important. That's why when uh, Jesus was talking of resurrection, Martha is like, of course, I've heard it a couple of times, you've expounded it, you know, I know what it means. I know all this will happen in the future, but what about now? And Jesus says, I am both, I am the resurrection and the life. I am not only for future promises. I am not only for future promises and beliefs, but I am the present. It's an active and living faith of the present not just the future. Are you experiencing it? And Jesus confronts her belief, stretches her belief, challenges her faith. Uh, I, I remember uh, similarly when uh, uh, you all know Pastor Bhutura, uh, when, uh, when Sister Rita had passed away, uh, Pastor Muthuram was here in Bangalore before his wife had passed away. And uh, um, this couple was, you know, since the, since the beginning of the ministry, I know, uh, you know how they were committed how they gave up everything and dedicated to the church. And uh, she had a cancer on her, you know, on her brain. And Muthuram was worried that this cancer was growing. So I remember, I, I vividly remember that. He came to Bangalore, he called me and said, Sandra, I want you know to go to a good hospital to take the scan and see what we can do with this cancer's growth. And uh, I went with him to Narayana Hridayala Hospital in Trump City and uh, we consulted a doctor. And, uh, you know, we did all, all of that and the doctor said, yes, it's possible, there is surgery, it's possible that you can remove it. And we have to gather maybe 8 lakhs, 10 lakhs, or, you know, we gave a big figure. So we didn't have that money and uh, Mutram, you know, returned, hoping that again he will return back to Bangalore for the treatment. 
So he goes back and I think it was not it's less than a month. I hear the news that Rita passed away. It was really a very one of the most distressing, distressing event uh, during that time. It, it was absolutely shocking for me personally. It was very uh, discouraging because I was there with them when they, when they started the church there. And then, you know, I, was, I saw how they left their job. I saw Rita, how she was committed to the church. She was doing Sunday school there. Uh, and I was totally shattered. So now she's dead, okay? And I'm, 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 I, I don't like funerals. I, I really hate funerals. I, I don't like to be there. So I was having two, I was having, I was in two minds whether to go or not to go. And you know, Pastor George was there. Pastor George is like, Sam, let's go. We have to go there. And I said, Pastor, it's COVID. COVID is, you know, there are so many cases happening. We shouldn't be going. I think you should be, you shouldn't be going. I will go, but you shouldn't be going. And you, you know, those who know Pastor George, you know that. It's like, COVID and me? COVID should be afraid of me, but I'm coming with you. We have to go. Uh, I was very scared of Pastor George because, you know, it was actually the beginning of that time when all this, you know, the, the infection was rising. I was extremely scared. Um, and Pastor George comes with me. So we go to the funeral. We sit there. And, uh, uh, I was, you know, if you go to a, a funeral, especially a Tamil funeral, you know what I mean. It's very dramatic, you know. They, they, they cry, they recount events, they recount, you know, all the past. Just last week, you know, you fed me. All that, you know, it's very dramatic. And I was already very distressed down and I went there and this was more discouraging. I did not know what to do. I was sitting in one corner, I mean, putting my heads down and Pastor George is next to me. Pastor George is like, Sam. You go there and speak a word. I said, are you crazy or not? Why don't you speak a word? Pastor George was like, Kannada, da. So I said, let's both sit here. Let's not do anything. Let's just be quiet and, you know, just, just be there in one corner. So we both are sitting there in the, the corner and I am like this. And he's also, you know, weeping and sad and, you know, thinking of all that. The only come, the only way I could comfort Pastor Mitra, I was talking about the future. Like here, Martha is telling, I know you're the resurrection. I know the future. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's the only thing I could do there. Believe that Rita is in heaven with Jesus. Believe the, you know, Jesus, uh, she's with the right hands. Don't worry and all that. That is the only thing that we could do. As in, there are, I don't know how many of you see these Christian fortune tellers who say, you know what, two days she's going to rise up. I don't, I don't think if anybody of you is doing, please don't do it. It's, it's really very dangerous that you give hopes to people, you know, a sickness, oh, this sickness is nothing's going to happen. Tomorrow she'll be alive and all that stuff. Please don't do fortune telling and horoscope and all that stuff. It's not your business. Uh, uh, please avoid if you're doing it. And uh, here, all I could do was that, you know, I could just talk about the future, talk about where she is, you know. That's all I could do. And uh, uh, and then, as we all, this mood is all very down and distressing and, uh, and you know what happens? Pastor Muthram's pastor walks in there. Okay, his mentor. In, when he was young, this pastor led him to Christ and helped him and all that. He walks in there, and I'm I'm like, who's this guy? And he just you know, and he comes there, and he's like, guys, what exactly are you all doing? Crying with the people who are crying? Come on, guys, get up. Let's sing a worship song. He took a worship song, and for three to four minutes, he said. He, he, I remember you telling me, Sam, this is the right time to speak the gospel. You are sitting like this fellow, you know, like lost all, you know, everything and crying. I said, Pastor, you do it. I can't do it. And he's like, okay, I'm going to speak the word. This is the right time that we can bring people to salvation and all that. Like, salvation? You what and all he's talking. And uh, you won't believe, he spoke for four minutes. Uh, he spoke from, you know, this well-known verse where in, Thess in Thessalonians we see Paul saying, brothers and sisters, you know, we do not want you to be uninformed and uh, uh, grieve like the rest of mankind who grieves without hope. That is the only passage he took, okay? I do not want you to grieve like the rest of the mankind out there without hope. He preached for four minutes. My God, it was mind-blowing. As in, suddenly the mood changed. Suddenly, I saw Muthuram was, you know, there was life in him. He's grieving. I mean, I'm not saying that he was laughing. He was grieving, but then... I could see that the atmosphere changed. There was hope, there was life. And I was like, from somewhere I went like, you know, it's like on steroids, from somewhere I went and I was like, wow, feeling good. And the mood changed, the atmosphere changed. The people who were dramatically crying stopped crying and they kept quiet. I saw there was an amazing uh, level of peace, calmness till the end, I could sense it. There was an amazing peace and calmness during that time. And I was just thinking, 
it is not just the future but you like jesus in the resurrection and the life what about the present are we able to experience jesus at the present and that day i really knew what this meant what jesus had said and the resurrection and the life at this moment when you're grieving do you experience me are you able to experience my presence on that day uh, um, uh, that four minute of you know uh, devotion or exaltation really changed it and we all experienced and experienced the presence of god the calmness of god the peace of god i think uh this is the tension that we all have the doc- the tension between doctrine and reality you know when jesus is you know what he's telling martha exactly is that what he's telling her is that i am the power behind the doctrine i am the power behind the knowledge that you have you are looking for that perfect day some day but it is today here on earth right now i want you to experience it uh, jesus takes martha one step higher and you know he gives her a higher view Uh, you know like it says in paul says the outer man may die but the inner man is renewed and will never die martha's faith was expanded as she learned to look at jesus not just for the future not just for the forward but at the present to help me in my current time of trouble and in need to trust in jesus and christ was able to refocus christ uh, martha's faith from a faithful god who will one day fulfill the promises some day fulfill the promises to god who is right now fulfilling it He is not only the God of tomorrow's promises, but God who is with us through all the current circumstances. And Jesus asks, "Do you believe? Do you believe who I am? Do you believe my words?" And to that, what does she reply? "I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into this world." Uh, you know, there is a similar passage you read in the Bible of another person who said this. Um, uh, if you know Peter, who you know, when Jesus asks, "Who do you think I am?" Peter made the exact same statement. Uh, uh, you are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. And Jesus, what does Jesus respond? He responds by saying, "On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail." Right belief in Christ is important because to those special ones, I believe, He has a dream of establishing a church on your grief and belief. He has a dream of establishing a church on what you know. He has a dream of drawing many. to believes by your experiences he wants that mustard seed to grow and become a tree so the birds will come and perch in its branches uh, you all know charles spurgeon uh, you all know charles spurgeon who once you know famously said he was a great preacher you all have heard about him he was you know at the age of 35 he suffered from arthritis and he had a lot of chronic illness you know uh he at that time apparently he had a church of 4000 members he had an orphanage uh, and uh, in the middle of all that he was go- undergoing severe criticism from you know other organizations and uh, he said often these attacks cost him more pain than anything else he had to experience but he said in the end he would talk of a suffering like this it is good for me to have been afflicted that i might know how to speak a word in season to one who is weary it is good that i am that i am afflicted so that it is good for me uh, so that i might know how to speak a word in season to one who is weary so he saw his suffering as god's means of uh, uh, molding him into a better minister let's continue to read uh, john chapter 11 verse 32 to 40 When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him she fell at his feet and said Lord if you had been here my brother would not have died when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled where have you laid him he asked come and see lord they replied Jesus wept then the Jews said see how he loved him but some of them said could not he have opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying jesus once more deeply moved came to the tomb it was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance take away the stone he said but lord said martha the sister of the dead man by this time there is a bad odor for he has been there for four days that jesus said did i not tell you if you believe you will see the glory of god is an interesting uh uh, uh you know Uh, thing what we read in this passage um both the sisters when jesus met said the same thing if only you were here my brother would not have died often you know i think of 
we we say that there, there is a verse that says jesus is a wonderful counselor and uh, i think it's true if you really want to learn about counseling you have to look at jesus he was an absolutely wonderful counselor how is it here in this passage there are these two sisters who come and talk to him the same thing okay one uh, mary and martha said the exact same thing if only you were here my brother would not have died and how does jesus respond to one person he confronts her stretches her faith confronts her belief challenges her belief and to other person how does he to the, the same question how does he respond he weeps uh the you know uh, uh, the, the truly a wonderful counselor how he balances truth and tears uh this was told by tim keller and i found it extremely wonderful especially in line with this passage you know tim keller wrote this i have put it on the slide by nature you are either a fixer or feeler you are too direct always or you are always crying and emotional mixing truth and tears is not easy you can't evaluate and yet not be condemning unless gospel changes you you can't do that gospel says be bold because god loves you so much he died for you but be humble that you were such a mess that he had to die for you learn to balance truth and tears when you are impatient with people and get into argue remember your own faith is a miracle and i i think none of us can do it it is very difficult i know that i am uh, for me i would uh, either be weeping with one person and never speak what i have to speak i know that some of you have one extremes but what we see jesus doing here is a wonderful example of how we can sometimes uh, you know when we have to counsel or speak the truth you know uh, 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 i was telling recently to two days back i think pumis and anju was here and i was telling them that you know uh, discipline without relationship is very uh, dangerous if you don't have a relationship and you go to discipline it can be very dangerous now here is jesus christ to one person who he confronts and to other person he weeps and how wonderfully he balances both truth and tears learning to not only be confrontational but also to sit with that person and weep if you don't have a relationship with that person when you confront and you you're too direct sometimes it can backfire all right let's go to the last the, the ending uh uh was 38 to 44 and i promise you we are done i will read from um yeah was 40 uh was 38 on was jesus once more deeply moved came to the tomb it was a cave with a stone laid across a stone take away the stone he said uh but lord said martha the sister of the dead man by the time there is a bad by this time there is a bad odor for he has been here for four days and jesus said did i not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of god this passage begins with the same statement jesus saying this is for the glory of god and it ends by jesus saying the exact same thing that it is for the glory of god uh, moses once asked lord show me your glory and what did god do in exodus chapter 33 we read this it says the lord said I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name the Lord in your presence I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will show compassion on whom I have to show compassion when Moses asked show me the glory of God this is what God got this is how God responded the glory of God was translated to God's goodness his mercy and his compassion and where was this best seen this was best displayed on the calvary right after lazarus uh, resurrection jesus himself who takes the cross who walks the path of cross and who who who, uh, uh, who has to die and we experience the fullness the, of god's goodness the mercy and compassion god's glory the ultimate form of god's glory with jesus himself going on the cross the lazarus resurrection was just a, a prelude or just uh, just something that that came before jesus is own uh, uh, something that uh, he himself had to experience and uh, i believe that we don't seek for more signs and miracles to see the glory of god the ultimate form of god's goodness mercy and compassion if you want to know it's already revealed on the cross you don't want a new miracle and a new sign and a new wonderful healing to show that god is good and kind and merciful god's glory god's goodness god's mercy god's compassion was was revealed at its best on the cross so that none of us will keep looking for it elsewhere you want to experience god's glory you want to experience god's mercy and compassion the cross is where you want to be where you experience it at the at at the best i believe that 
uh, in a living faith, in a living relationship with Jesus Christ that is true victory, that we believe and worship a God that has overpowered death, enemy, sickness, and we want to continue living in the promise of Christ that said, who said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. I believe that every, I, I believe that every crisis that we experience in our life has a divinely intended purpose. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this time of uh, uh, devotion that we had. But truly, we want to thank you for the status of sonship that we experience in you, Lord. Sometimes when we go through griefs and disappointments, discouragements, help us to remind ourselves that, Lord, you are teaching us something. That you are trying to establish the seed that is soon to grow more, to take roots, so that no wind no trouble, nothing will shape, shake us, Lord. But often you bring these so that we will be established and rooted in you. And Lord, help the seed not to be on the path so that Satan comes and takes it away. The Satan comes and steals it away. That we will, it will be like the veil that is blinding our eyes, that we are not able to see the light of the gospel. Help us, Lord, to repent. And every time we hear the word and we come to your scripture, Lord, help us to have this this seed truly to 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 enter our hearts lord jesus that lord every time we look into the scripture and we study and meditate that it will it will have its root father it will grow father establish the faith so that lord nothing will shake us and we also pray that lord you will help us to experience the resurrection and the life not just the future promises not just tomorrow that wonderful day that we are expecting or the second coming but lord today at this moment help us to experience you through a living relationship with you. Help us to know that, Lord, you are challenged as you challenged Martha. What do you believe? Is it just a doctrine or is it is it just a facts and some historical thing or is it, uh, 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 do you believe in the power behind it? Help us to experience that power, Lord. Help us to taste that power every day, Father. Help the word that we hear to be translated, that, Lord, that we will always be in wonder and awe, Father. We thank you, Lord, when we don't have answers, when we are grieving, when we don't know what is why this is happening or what, what is happening we can turn to you and we can receive comfort in you we thank you for your uh, presence in our lives that is always with us lord when we think about it father it is the greatest gift that we have your presence in our lives the comforting presence in our life when we go through all this there's nothing more that we need lord jesus and lord jesus we again thank you for your ultimate glory that you revealed on the cross just as moses who asked where show me the glory Lord, when we ask, show your glory, we know that we can look to the cross where your goodness, your mercy and compassion was revealed. Help us, Lord, every time our hearts are looking for a sign, a miracle or something that we can look to the cross and know that there's nothing bigger that God can do in our lives than this. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.